everyone. Welcome tonight to our Writers Without Borders series. The series features writers from around the world or who are engaged with writing around the world whose fiction, drama, poetry, memoir, journalism, and performance art demand an international and a globally minded readership and response. Throughout the series, Penn's provost is challenging students and faculty who form the literary community at the Kelly Writers House to bring writers whose voices, whether because of regional unrest, cultural turmoil, aesthetic misunderstanding, the difficulty of travel, problems of translation, et cetera, have not been much heard here. And obviously that applies to our program tonight. Um, the setting here at the Writer's House, always conducive to workshop style give and take, seems apt for introducing these writers and editors to the broader Penn community and to our internationalist Philadelphia area neighbors and partners. So support is generally generously provided by Seth Gins in the Office of the Provost for the series. So look for future events. We have about four or five a year. Um, Mark Weiss is a poet, translator, publisher, and editor. He's published six books of his own poetry, co-edited the book Across the Line, or El Otro Lidio. Oh, sorry, I got <laughs> El Otro Lado, The Poetry of Baja California, and translated Stet, selected poems of Jose Cozer. Um, Cuba has had a large cultural impact on the United States, continues to have a large cultural impact, uh, but its poetic stamp has been smaller, due in part to historic censorship and the ignorance of the Academy at large. In this new anthology, Mark has collected over 60 years worth of Cuban poetry, diverse, intense, and beautiful. This multilingual anthology includes many poems and poems translated for the first time and available in English. So please help me welcome Mark. I pointed out to the people, who, does this thing actually make noise or is it just for the recording? <laughs> no, okay. Um, I pointed out to the people who did the Cuban spread that you'll see those lovely Cuban sandwiches out there. They're not authentic. The bread is much, much better <laughs> than you get in Cuba. And not because the Cubans are incapable of getting decent bread. Uh, Castro actually imported a chain of French bakeries to upgrade the quality of the bread and they very quickly started making traditional Cuban bread because nobody would buy the baguettes. It, they like really, really spongy, well, this is going out on the internet, I better keep my mouth shut. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm gonna very briefly um, do a little bit of self-touting. I was told to speak about the Cuba stuff, but hey, what the hell, new book of mine as landscape from Chak's Press, which I only have the one copy, but people can look at it. Uh, and more to the point, um, Jose Cozer's selected poem, Stet, that I edited and translated, which I think we presented here in this very room. Um, and then the earlier anthology, the Baja California anthology, which is where I started doing Spanish translation and learned most of my very limited Spanish. Thank God I had a little bit of Italian to get you know gobbled up by Spanish. Um, and then I got involved with this around 2000 and gave a great deal of blood and a great deal of time to. Um, I want to, before I forget, I want to dedicate tonight to Michael Gizzi, a wonderful poet and a lovely man who died quite suddenly. I mean, uh, none of us at this point in the poetry community outside of his immediate circle know the details. Um, I mean, Conrad told me a little bit. Um, but, you know, we, we really don't know. But it, it died suddenly and, qu and way too young. Um, and uh, uh, for those, well, when you start reading his poetry, you'll know what a blow it is. Really a wonderful poet. Okay. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about Cuba's culture for just a moment. I went to Cuba only once. I went in 2000 <coughs> when I was beginning to think about the anthology. Um, and people that I knew not people who didn't know Cuba that I knew would, would, would ask me things like, are you going to bring back any folk art? As if I were going to Mexico. At the time I was living in San Diego, so you know, I'd come back with folk art all the time. Well, Cuba is better educated than the United States and more cosmopolitan. Um, 
there, sure, there's folk art everywhere, but it would be the kind of folk art that urban people make, uh, outsider art, rather than, rather than some kind of traditional thing like Mexican pottery. Uh, and that's, that's a, a, one of the great triumphs of a very troubled revolutionary period where there's a lot that can be said that's very negative, a great deal that can be said that's very negative, is the educational system, um, which is superb. And another one of its ambiguous triumphs has been the creation of the infrastructure of publishing and writing that didn't exist before. There were always writers. There were no publishing companies for poetry. Um, the, the great magazine, uh, one of the great journals ever anywhere, I mean, you can read it from the, from the first issue to the last as a continuous postmodernist narrative, Origenes, which gave the dates to this anthology. It was 1944 it was founded. Um, its circulation was 100 copies. Uh, there just was no infrastructure. And almost immediately upon his success in the revolution, Castro set up uh, the um, Union of Writers and Artists, of, uh, which um, Nicolas Guillen was the first head of. Uh, and set up art schools and, in, and enormously improved the education system. Uh, I, the firing had barely stopped when he sent out high school kids into the countryside uh, to teach people how to read. So, I mean, that's, that's a key factor. Um, but Cuba had always been well, for a long time had been deeply involved with poetry, and a lot of, the, of Cuba's national heroes are in fact poets first and everything else second. Uh, starting with Heredia, who, uh, the great 1830s poet who went into exile, had to go into exile, uh, and down to Jose Marti. Um, Jose Marti is, imagine a country in which um, you have combined the, the figures of Walt Whitman and George Washington. That's the role of Jose Marti in, in uh, Cuba's culture. His statue is everywhere. The informal national anthem begins with some verses of his, Guantanamera. You know, Yo soy un hombre sincero de donde crece las palmas is the beginning of his most important book. Um, uh, people memorize the poetry. They learn it in school. They're serious about it. And that presence is, I mean, it's always there. And it's been a formative presence in the 20th century, in the period that, that I'm dealing with. Um, his work, most of his poetry wasn't published. He died in 1895. Most of his work wasn't published, uh, wasn't available until about 1920, when the generation that begin, in, begin this book were coming of age. And so I'll start with a poem that's not in the anthology uh, of Jose Marti, my translation. Two homelands have I, Cuba and the night. Or are they one? The sun's majesty but now withdrawn, trailing long veils, she comes to me, Cuba, in the guise of a grieving widow, holding a carnation. That blood-stained flower is my shattered breast, the hollow that held my heart. Now is the hour come to die. The night is made for parting, light and speech a barrier, the universe more eloquent than man. The red flame of the candle flutters like a flag summoning to battle. Clutching it to me, I open the window. Mute as a cloud that hides the sky, the widow passes, scattering flowers. So that's what, that's where Cuban, modern Cuban poetry really starts. And Marti is not just one of their great poets, he's also a kind of a national conscience for poets. Um, th they write about him all the time. You know, a lot of the poets in this book have been, are in fact Marti scholars. Uh, and they're very aware of it, that this is not, I mean, he was, he was the great martyr for, for not just for the invention, of, for the creation of a free Cuba, but for the nature of the Cuban state. Um, his statement that anybody born in Cuba is a Cuban 
is largely responsible for the degree of equality that there is in Cuba. I mean, it became a sacred text. And here's um, a piece by the youngest of the group that formed around the magazine Origenes. This is um, Lorenzo Garcia Vega, and this is um, Christopher Wink's translation. It's called Martian Text. Marti descends dancing from an electronic shell with the young debutante. They whirl there with the allegorical obituary, the discolored scarlet or the white or the faded blue, colors of the albino prism. From an elect electronic shell, looking and recalling all the available time, we, all of us, have time. From an electronic shell, applause with silence. A discolored scarlet is hoisted from the corners. There are pine trees. And in the hallway, in the hallway chair, the one whose old age slips by. From an electronic shell, the albino night has returned. Marti leaves the dance now and goes back to founding the nation. There are bones. There's a non-existent park. There's a faded bench. Marti puts the dead man to bed. He puts the dead man to sleep on the bench's night inaudible, and a discolored scarlet in the non-existent park. One of the things that the, that the Origenes group, um, it, they're, they're known as the, 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 the Origenes generation, <coughs> one of the things that they were involved in was the creation of what's come to be known as the neo-barocco which is one of the leading tendencies in Latin American literature. It started in Cuba with the Origenes group, although there was a battle within the group about that. Um, what, what had existed in Cuba was, um, at that time, a for, a, something called uh, vanguardismo, which does not mean avant-gardism in our sense. It's a specific literary movement. <coughs> and it had a lot of facets, but the facet that caught hold in Cuba um, was something ca called conversacionalismo. And the, the, the um, late in its, in, 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 in the, in its development, um, Eberto Padilla um, became its great champion against the neo-barocco and allied himself, saw himself as coming from Robert Lowell. So that it very much, that where you're going to get something akin to confessionalism, it's going to be there, but it's also a very good format for political discourse and for essay poem. But it's quite varied. Um, so I'm going to read some of, some of that kind of poetry. I mean, the, 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 the Garcia Vega is clearly of the neo-barocco sort. But let me see if I can, I'm making this up as I go along in case nobody noticed. All right, so on the other side in the Origenes group <coughs> uh, was um, Virgilio Piñera. <coughs> I'm going to be swallowing this thing all the way in. Uh, he and Lizama, start, Lizama Lima, who founded um, Origenes and who is, by any accounts, the greatest Cuban poet, uh, but also profoundly complex, very, very difficult. Um, they started out as good friends. And they had a falling out largely over difficulty in poetry and also Catholicism versus atheism. And the falling out got to the part, a point where they actually had a fist fight. Uh, and then in old age, um, they became the best of friends again. So it's, it's a, a long storied relationship. This is a poem of Pinera's. <coughs> <coughs> I will never leave them. When he opened his eyes to the world, my father said, let's take a stroll around town. The town was houses, trees, clothes on the clotheslines, men and women singing and sometimes quarreling. How many times I saw the stars. How many times, fearing their inhuman attraction, I hoped to float alone in, this, in space while beneath me Cuba kept its blueness where death lingers. Then I smelled the roses or in the military band, the out-of-tune voice of the singer drowned me in heavenly delights. I will never leave them, I whispered. Even if they nail me to the cross, I will never leave them. 
Even if they spit at me, I will remain among the people. And I will shout with that love that can shout its name to the four winds, the phrase that the people constantly repeat. They're killing me, but I'm having fun. And a later poem of his. On my neighbor's door. On my neighbor's door, a chilling note. Go away, I'm weeping. No one can comfort me. <coughs> now I dream of my neighbor. And in my dream, I open the door. Within, I see my own face, my own face bathed in tears. <coughs> so it's very different from what Lorenzo was doing. I'm not going to read you any Lizama because the important poems are very, very long, by the way. They're great poems, but it's worth, you'll have to check those out on your own. <coughs> what you see repeatedly in the book, there's a, um, there's a veiled political statement often going on in the poems. Um, for much of the period, <coughs> veiled pol politics was as much as you were going to get. Either that it was going to be, or it was going to be um, pro-administration, but not just pro-administration. It had to be optimistic. Uh, anything else, was, this was starting around 1970, um, and for about 12 years thereafter. And almost all the significant poets were not published during those years. They were banned. Um, famously, there was um, the prosecution of one poet. It's the only time it happened for his work. Um, and that was um, Eberto Padilla that I mentioned before. Um, he published the book from which I took the poems in this <coughs> anthology, Fuera del Fuego. It won a big prize in Cuba. <coughs> I'm sorry about this, from the National Writers Union. Um, and simultaneous with the prize, there was an, um, a statement by the, in, uh, the Interior Ministry condemning it as counter-revolutionary. So the book was published with a statement that it was counter-revolutionary. And it was immediately withdrawn from the shelves. I mean, he got his prize, but it was immediately withdrawn from the shelves. Um, the people who were behind the book, like Lizama, who was one of the jurors who selected it, were in deep trouble. They were in trouble anyway. It was a, consolidate, a period of consolidation of power. And um, uh, two years passed, and Padilla was arrested. He was kept in jail for about six weeks, um, perhaps tortured. I mean, his own account, by his own account, there was torture, but not what we're used to from Iraq, and it was lightweight in comparison. But it was still torture and of course a lot of fear. He didn't know when he was going to be let out. There was no trial or anything. Um, and he was let out on condition that he give a, a public confession of his faults and name names in the public confession. And he, among the names he named was Lizama, who was really who they were after, um, because he was more a part of the power structure of literature in the country. But here's a poem from that, from that book, a short poem. Cuban poets don't dream anymore. Cuban poets don't dream anymore, not even at night. They get up to close the door so they can write alone when suddenly the wood creaks, the wind pushes them adrift, some hands catch them by the shoulder, turn them around, set them face to face with other faces, sunk in swamps burning with napalm. And the world flows above their mouths and the eye is obliged to see, to see to see. Poetics. Tell the truth. At least tell your truth. And after, let anything happen. Let them tear up your beloved page. Let them knock down your door. Let people crowd around your body as if you were a miracle or a corpse. One of the poets who left immediately from Cuba, one of the, I think, the great Cuban poets, uh, Gaston Baquero, who was a member of the Origenes group. Um, Baquero was, in fact, a member of the Batista administration. 
<coughs> whether voluntarily or not, we really don't know, but he, he was appointed to the appointive parliament under Batista. And so he had no choice. I mean, Castro goes in one door, he goes out the other. And he went into exile in Spain, where he lived in pretty severe poverty for a long time. And he was never a political poet, but it's kind of hard not to hear the political, at least in the form of a commentary on exile, in his poem, Fable. I have to see what voice I've got, hold on. <coughs> this is the worst time of the year for me for allergies. Oh, that last translation was by Jason Weiss. Uh, this one, the others, when I don't say who it is, it's me. Fable. My name is Philemon, my family name Ustaritz. I have a cow, a dog, a rifle, and a hat. Vagabonds, wanderers with no land but the sky, we live beneath the loftiest roof. Neither rain, nor storm, nor ocean, nor river keeps us from wandering from meadow to meadow. My name is Philemon, my family name Ustaritz. We never sleep twice be beneath the same star. Each day a landscape, each night another light. A traveler today may find us near the Amazon and tomorrow perhaps by the yellow at the moment the sun breaks above the horizon. We are like clouds, but real, solid. A man, a dog, a cow, a hat. We sicken, we love, we hate, and are hated. Vagabonds, wanderers, with no land but the sky. My name is Philemon, my family name Ustaritz. My own come with me, bright or in shadow, but with their own names, their own physical shadows, real creatures, dreams, vapors of a magic that out of the unbelievable builds all we believe. My name is Philemon, my family name, Ustaritz. Matter, ciphers, smoke, carried by the wind, hungry for the infinite, a dog, a cow, an actual hat. Simple, without mystery, we continue our voyage. That's why, when I take to the road, I say, that my name is Philemon and my family name Ustaritz, that the cow's name is Rosamund of Hungary, and that I took the dog's name from a star. I call it Aldebaran, and it leaps, and it laughs, and it sings like a tenor bursting his throat with song. That was one of the first Cuban po poems that I read. Uh, I'm going to talk about instant addiction. Okay. This is a poem by <coughs> Eliseo Diego, if I can find it, the one that I wanted. Eliseo had, after the revolution, he had had a lifelong interest in um, fairy tales and um, also a member of the Origenes group, but you'll hear how different from Lorenzo and certainly from Lozama he was. After the revolution, he was made the first, I forget what the exact title was, but he was in charge of children's literature for Cuba, for the Cuban National Library. And his job was, uh, his Spanish literature is not very rich in children's literature. And what with the literacy program, there was a real need for it. So the assignment was to create a children's literature. And he translated most of the great collections of European folk tales into Spanish. Um, and um, wrote only a very few poems that come directly out of folk tales, and I can't find the one I'm looking for. Hold on. Here it is, The Girl in the Forest. My soul's red riding hood, the wolf lurks in the shadow where no one expects him, and he watches you from his miserable rock his solitude, his enormous hunger. You ask him, why are your eyes so big and round? Blind, he answers, for to see you better, weeping. You ask again, 
Why are your ears so big and he, O oh music of the world, to hear you, only to hear you? And then the rest is darkness, impossible to understand. One of, the poem, of his poems is printed in this hand light, a, ver, a, a handout. It's a very important poem. Um, the Equilibrista, um, the uh, rope dancer's risk. <coughs> but I'm not going to read that. You have it here. So you can. It's astonishing how much really great poetry is unavailable to us in English. I mean, poetry is, of course, <coughs> immensely difficult to translate. And a poem like, a poet like Eliseo is especially difficult because you're really not involved, I mean, well, he's a perfect lyricist. Uh, there's a great deal going on, but it's mostly not in the words. It's mostly in the, in the, the echoes. But nonetheless, I mean, it's just astonishing how much stuff we don't have and how much stuff we don't have from our nearest neighbors, like Cuba, and the reason I did the Baja California anthology uh, when I was living in San Diego and realized that nobody knew what was going on across the border except the scandals. You know, so. All right, this is um, Fina Garcia Marus. Fina uh, is now about 85, 87. Um, she was the only woman in the otherwise boys club of the, of the Origenes group. And is a very great poet. Um, there's, a, there's a long poem of hers in here. Uh, uh, she was something of a mystical Catholic, and one of those poems is in here, but it's 11 pages, so we'll have to do with these smaller poems. She wrote a book. She was very interested in pop culture. A lot of Cuban poets are. Um, she wrote a whole book of translations of songs from Hollywood mu musicals, as well as translations, in quotes, of songs that should have been in Hollywood musicals, <laughs> right? Um, she also did a whole book of, this, of moments in Charlie Chaplin. So, I mean, and this is something you'll see over and over again in Cuban literature, but this one is from a series of poems called English Grammar, Grammatica Inglesa. Um, okay, I'll just read some of them. Little Elegy. Where are you, my son? Oh, I'm here. Where is your sister? In the kitchen. Does Emma have two cats? Only two. We have one mouth and just two ears. Is your brother rich? Oh, yes. And are you poor? Oh, yes. The house is old. The book is gray. Where are you, butterfly? Tell me. Tell me, can I do anything for you? I had a bird. Do you know its name? Use of the plural. Changing plural to singular and singular to plural. Are the rooms large? Are the basements damp? My mother has a garden with a small horse in it. Do the brothers have feathers? Do the sisters have oranges? Day has night, sir. The month has days and nights. The room, the kitchen, the basement, the tulip, the umbrella. And you, do you have oranges or feathers? Do you have brothers or sisters? This grammar book. In this grammar book, there are funny examples, but others are very sad and perhaps they should not be shown to children. Calmly, it says, the watchmaker has sold all his watches. And then, there's a certain logic to this, Mary is sad. That man had many friends, but he's lost them all. He is very old. I want to go to the theater. The birds build their nests. Who is bu buying two shirts for the poor boy? You always sell me yesterday's paper. You'll notice I didn't look at my watch, so I have no idea how far we've come. 
um, I don't know what time it is, and I don't know how long I was supposed to read. So, I mean, I want you guys to be able to ask me lots of questions if you have any. So I'm going to jump around a little, and I'll come back to things. Um, okay. Luis Rogelio Nogueras um, is um, almost universally known in Cuba as um, Wiki El, Ro El, El Rojo. He was a redhead. Uh, his first book he called Carrot Top. <clears throat> like everybody else in Cuba, he, he was involved in, you know, everybody in Cuba works for the government. So he was involved in politics. It's, you know, it's a long story. He may have been involved in the Padilla affair, the, the persecution of Padilla. Well, he certainly was to an extent. It's not clear how much of it was just to save his own skin. I mean, it's hard to demand heroism of people you don't know, basically, and of people whose situation you can't really experience. But at any rate, he's a, he's, um, a ki he died very young, and he's become, he remains a kind of a figure of youth, somewhat the way Paul Blackburn does for a lot of people in this country, where um, uh, you know, his, his sexual exploits are things people like to talk about and remember fondly. And he was apparently a very nice man as well. Um, so I'm going to read two of his poems, very much uh, in, the conver in the conversational mode. Woman emerging from the closet. I am in my room watching the closet for hours. When this woman emerges, how will I answer her? Will I chew my nails, speak to her of Blake? She will tell me that she's not interested in hell. I have been in the room for hours, whistling, watching the closet out of the corner of my eye, crushing my hat between my hands. When she emerges, I will raise the curtain, point to the balcony, tell her that farther off a sun is burning that doesn't want to die. But she, tell, she will tell me that she has no wish to quarrel with the stars. My heart is pale now. My hands are cold. My, own ga my gaze fixed on the closet. When she emerges, I will make myself pass for an apple, a soft hand, a coat on a hanger but she will say that she's not interested in my books. Tonight, she will emerge from the closet. Once more, she will request my heart, request her fee. She will ask me. Loss of the love poem called Mist. Yesterday, I wrote a magnificent poem Sadly, I lost it somewhere, and now I can't remember it, but it was great. It said, more or less, that I was in love. It said it, of course, in another way. It was really good. But she was in love with another guy. And then there was a really beautiful part about the trees, the wind, and then it said something about death. It didn't say death, of course. It said dark claw or something like that. Then there were some extraordinary lines, and toward the end, it told how I walked through an empty street, convinced that life would begin again on some corner. Of course, it didn't say it that pretentiously. It was a good poem. Sad loss, sad memory. For a lot of his poems, uh, he made up um, biographies of poets. He did an anthology uh, of poems, many of them written beforehand, had been published as his own poems beforehand. But each one supplied with a biography of different poets from ancient China, ancient Greece, other countries, <coughs> all of them supposedly translations. Um, I'll read you one more poem of his, a poem. In the, in the vortex of class warfare, he wrote a love poem. Confronted by the hunger for justice, he wrote a love poem. Surrounded by death and torture, he wrote a love poem. Among blood and bullets, he wrote a love poem, a poem for no one, for a love who didn't exist. And now, love to the depth of his shadows by this girl who kisses his wounds, now that in the chill of night she covers him with her naked body, he arms himself with pen and paper, leaves the bed, and without disturbing his lover's dream, writes a political poem, a poem shaken by strikes and battles.
Okay, one of the great discoveries for me of this whole process, uh, well, Rogelio wasn't bad. I mean, all of these guys are pretty good, but Ra Raul Hernandez Novas, <coughs> who was apparently schizophrenic, um, killed himself when he was 34. He had a distinguished career before that. Wrote a lot of poetry um, that was well received, won all the prizes and everything. Again, like a lot of these people, very involved in um, popular culture. He did a whole book of sonnets that I hope to translate at some point, um, based on Fellini's La Strada, retelling the story but reinvesting himself, investing himself in it in various ways. This poem uh, is called Over the Cuckoo's Nest and is dependent on the film of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And it's quite long. Uh, I'll just read as much as my voice will hold out for, but it'll only be the first or second part. <coughs> and it begins with, a, a, with uh, an epigraph from Lizama's Thoughts in Havana uh, from uh, James Irby's translation. That's uh, Ken's brother, Ken Irby's brother, that's in the earlier in the book. They have some show windows and wear some shoes. In those show windows, they alternate the mannequin with the stuffed ossifrage and everything that has passed through the forehead of the lonesome buffalo's boredom. If we don't look at the show window, they chat about our insufficient nakedness that isn't worth a figurine from Naples. If we go through it and don't break the glass. In those fearful evenings when no one calls at the door and the doorbells don't ring and the house is a large refrigerator stuffed with silence, in those evenings that weigh upon the parks, interfering with life and games, evenings that press like a cruel burden upon the shoulders of the unmoving statue, in the midst of a rain that doesn't fall but soaks, bones naked in the absence of voices, having no one in my experience, I think of you, Billy. I al also think of you, Bi Billy, rebuilding my memories in stone, memories heavy as a fountain of blood, and I have nothing to say to you because no one calls and there's no one in my experience. Maybe we play in the same park, a mute telephone between us, an electric cord coiled, vibrating, working in the white curve of distance, the path at whose end a sad snow falls, the flight of a silent bird, a migratory bird's promise seen with the soil of Wisconsin, my bones gone to pot, a telegram carried by birds, and between us, nothing but a shining window that I pass through without breaking the glass. What sugary gull skimmed the waves of those Virginia seas where the ship of fools sailed with all of us aboard? With all of us, Billy, with all of us, my God, we're just a bunch of cowards, a bunch of crazies on a spinning boat, and we toss sails and anchors and rudder into the sea, and we let the enemy wind take us, and we wait we await Jaws, and Jaws doesn't come, and the ship doesn't sink, and the whale, white as a crystal soon, this tomb doesn't come. Mac, 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 where have you gone? You've left me at the helm, and I don't know how to steer this ship. And you hid, you hid with candies, but instead of laughing, you were sad. Tell me why you hid with the gloss of candy on your lips and left us alone. Why, brother, why, father, have you left us alone on this ship of fools that I didn't know how to steer? Give me the logbook that the sirens thumbed with those green cloud-like hands, those hands of seaweed and hyacinth, and in the logbook, after the sterile night without sweet or games, after the dreamed-of game without candies, no sugar star in the mouth, the heavenly piñata empty and the tender club in our hands, the club with which we strike blindly without hitting the piñata, pinning the shameful tail and ears on the unspeakable donkey, without finding the ball that's as round as the world in the empty stadium after the rainy Halloween of closed doors. They've poisoned the candy, hid needles in the apples, and mute, unlit pumpkins, for pumpkins next to the body of a twinkling star. In the white logbook, Billy, I write rien as the king did after his empty wedding night. And it goes on 
uh, through a lot of quotations from the Beatles, actually, you know, that helped structure the poem. Th it's quite long. It's a great poem. It's a, it's a wonderful, it was a great experience translating. It's a wonderful experience just reading it. And I'm going to read just a very few more. I mean, um, do people ha are people going to have questions, I hope? Yeah? Okay, I'm depending on you. Okay. Um, okay. This is by Soleda Rios, um, who of the younger, well, she's not so young anymore, she's about, she must be about 50 now, uh, of the younger women poets is, is my favorite. Um, there's a real disparity in the number of men and women poets in Cuba for no reason that I can fathom. The women poets don't talk about it. It's just not an issue. Um, there's lots of women writers, for some reason they don't, and, and the, writer, the women writers, um, many of them are highly honored. I mean, they're national figures. So <coughs> who knows, but at any rate, she's one of the best of the women, I think. <coughs> and, and comes very much out of um, a Santeria background, although it gets transmuted. Maleva and the Children in Paradise. And she has a, an, um, an epigraph from Borges. The only paradise is not forbidden to man are those that are lost. In the garden, further back, Maleva sees children falling from the trees. Those innocent children that we once were, diapered in white, fall from the trees. But they fall to their deaths so that we may forget. And they laugh as they fall because they enjoy in advance the sorrow to come, the despair that soon or late we all succumb to. The death of these children is not predestined. They prefigure it in the oddness of their games. Before, whether an instant or 200 centuries ago, the children invented games as if nostalgic for other children. The first, the last that return to begin the lines now invent nothing. They shout, mummy meat, mummy meat. We want the head on the shield who pretend to be the last who are the first. The children, whether an instant or 200 centuries ago, came into the garden with roles assigned. They fall from the trees. They fall. Okay, I'm going to stop with this next one um, so that there's time for questions. I, I really have no idea. What time is it? Anybody? 10 of 7. Yeah, that's, that's enough. To be, uh, one more. This is by uh, Alessandro Molina. Al Alessandra's in her early 30s. Um, she left Cuba maybe six years ago, five, six years ago, legally. I mean, this, the deal now is that almost anybody who wants to gets an exit visa by the, the, issued by the Cuban government. There are, there are exceptions, but the exceptions have become notorious. The issue about leaving Cuba on an exit visa is having the money to be able to do it. Um, artists get to leave all the time because they get invited places. You know, and some of them settle in other countries. And some of them come back again. Um, Cuban law at this point, you're, you remain a Cuban citizen or a Cuban resident if you spend one month of the year in Cuba. So a lot of people go back and forth. One of the things that's liberalized under, under Raul. At any rate, um, this is um, Alessandro Molina, and this is a poem she wrote for her girlfriend. Um, it's called Herbalist. The pharmacist's youngest daughter, dressed like a schoolgirl, set out each morning for petal and root, bulrush and honey. Fear did what love could. It made her a stalker, a beast of gaze and scent. She stole, she watered, she begged of the soil that was also the soil of the dead. Ancient star, son of other times that rots the flower's pollen, that sweetens it, why did you awaken me to the good and the suffering of others, but without the magic, the spells, the effective, the effective action or power with which the pharmacist's daughter hid a language, kept secret her formulas. Now, this is the tip of the iceberg. 
I mean, there, uh, this is not even best highlights from it. I mean, it's just a, an incredibly rich poetic culture. Applause is nice. Applause is nice, but questions are better. And don't all shout at once. Well, the, the poems in, in, in Origenes are pretty, you know, most of them are pretty widely anthologized at this point. I mean, these were the, these were the, the great masters. Of, it would be like, like tracking down T.S. Eliot at this point in Cuba. The problem was that all the others. Um, books published in Cuba are hard to get. <coughs> They're published in relatively small editions. And um, the curse of literacy means that people don't sell their books very often. So they don't get, not too many of them get into the used market. Uh, when I started buying Cuban books, the, the books that I needed were not available in American libraries or in very few American libraries. Um, but I was in competition with, say, Princeton, you know, with, with, with everybody who was buying books. Fortunately, I had a very good friend from high school, actually, who had, that I'd stayed close to a very, for a long time, who was at the time the only um, foreign book dealer working in Cuba. So I gave him a list and he would ask his sources and they would find some of them for me. It was very difficult. It always felt like I was doing espionage. I mean, when I went to Cuba, I came back um, through customs, which was a laugh because they didn't check anything, with two big suitcases full of nothing but books. Yeah? Um, what, what year did you live in Cuba? I was there in 2000. Okay. How many of the sources did you research for your research? Not too many, actually. I mean, I, I corresponded with a lot of them by email. Um, I met with um, uh, Miguel Barnett, and I met with um, uh, um, God. The name escapes me at the moment. Uh, uh, um, Bretamar, Fernandez Bretamar. Um, I don't think I met with any other poets while I was there. I've, I've met, I've known a fair number of Cuban poets outside of Cuba, and I was already working on wherever I put it. The uh, the um, Coser book. Um, so through him, I was I met a lot of people. I mean, I know Lorenzo Garcia Vega, for instance, um, and I've subsequently met a lot of the poets. I mean, after the anthology. But I, it was th that wasn't the kind of trip that I was doing. Yeah. This one, yeah, this is entirely mine. Um, this one I did about half of the poems. This one is entirely mine. I mean, for poets themselves? Oh, yeah, it's an interesting situation. Okay. Um, when UNEAC, the, the, union of the National Union of Artists and, and Writers, was founded, or writers and artists, I guess, it was founded, um, what it did was it gave poets, it gave writers a salary. Writers were salaried workers. Um, not everybody got into UNEAC. At the beginning, it w the getting in was not so much a political thing. It became more so later. And being expelled from UNEAC meant you had to find another way to make a living. Um, you know, people who were out of favor wound up shelving books at bookstores. Um, UNEAC has become less and less important as the value of a salary in Cuba in Cuban pesos has dropped. I mean, the standard salary in Cuba was, was uh, the equivalent of $20 American per month. And that was fine. No, that was fine. It paid for everything because everything was heavily subsidized. After the Soviet Union collapsed or after they stopped subsidizing the Cuban economy, um, the, it, it became nothing. It became star starvation wages and everybody had to find other things to do. As a result, um, UNEAC over time became less important and people put up with the restrictions less and less. There are special stipends. If you, almost every book published in Cuba is a prize book. And um, for you win the prize and get the book published, you get a certain amount of, of money as well. Right. No MFA programs, by the way. They've never even conceived of it. Yeah.
Well, and that's an interesting question. I mean, I, I don't know that I, I don't. There, there are there are the group of poets who are known uh, informally as the oficialistas. Um, they're all very much a part of the government. Almost all of them have been in the doghouse at various times. I mean, you know, some of them were among the people who were not published for twelve years after, for ten or twelve years after Padilla. Most of them actually, but um, the ones who have remain who have become again after that period official. Uh, Cynthia Vitier, who's now died, <coughs> um, Pablo Armando Fernandez, Retamar, um, uh, Nancy Morejon, a few other, uh, Barnett very much so, um, a few others. Many of them hold government positions uh, within the administration. I mean, Barnett, I think, is on the Council of State, plus a couple of other things. Um, I don't know if you'd call them favorite poets. I mean, they're, they're, they're not, you know, I, it, it's a hard one to answer. I mean, I don't know if it's because they, I don't think it's because the Castro brothers like their verse better. Okay, I mean, they're useful one way or another. This is, now, I think we have to be very careful not to judge people on that basis. All right, most of them are not, to my mind, among the very best of the poets, but they're not bad. Okay, so I mean, it, you know, it's, it's just, it's a different situation. If you live under, um, even a relatively gentle autocracy, and it's relatively gentle if you think in terms of Stalin. It's not relatively gentle in, other, in any other terms, but if it is in those terms. Even then, um, you do what you have to do. I mean, you've got kids to feed. You do what you have to do. I, I talk about it at <coughs> Well, can I tell you what I did do? Okay. Uh, I talk about it at length in the, in, in the introduction, and it, it's heavily footnoted. Uh, it, this, this is, it, it's, it's irrefutable, and it caused a huge scandal at the time, not so much among American intellectuals, but among world intellectuals. A lot of the supporters of the Castro regime, regime dropped it at that point because they were so horrified, including, for instance, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, you know, who was certainly a communist. Um, so it, that was a real event. Now, why it happens, another story. I, ha I, have, I have my own theories about why the repression happened at that point. I mean, there had been movements toward repression before that. There was the, the, the incarceration of gay people, for instance, uh, that ended officially in 1967. Uh, but for, from 65 to 67, there were concentration camps. Don't think Nazis, it was nowhere near that severe, but work camps, certainly deprivation. And it was aimed at, largely at gay people, gay people and Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, that also happened, but what happened, a lot of the politics a lot of the politics in Cuba is improvisatory. No country in the Caribbean has ever managed to survive for very long without uh, a world power patron. Um, when the United States was no longer available as a patron, they had to find another patron. And uh, Soviet communism at that point was quite repressive. Um, and I think part of what Castro was doing was trying to justify himself as worthy of patronage by the Soviet Union. I think that's part of what was going on. The kind of freedom that poets had up to that point in post-revolutionary Cuba would have been absolutely anathema in the Soviet Union. So I think that's part of what was going on. And I think even the persecution of gay people, while Cuba has always been, I mean, homophobic is a funny word. I don't think it was homophobic so much as just anti-gay. Uh, as a culture, it was also very tolerant of it. You just didn't talk about it. 
Um, the Soviet Union was much less so, much more puritanical. And I think part of what was going on was an attempt to say, hey, we're one of you guys. So, I mean, you know, necessity, again, it's, it's in, a, in a broader sense, it's feeding the kids. But it, I've documented very well, and that's really, it's incontrovertible that it happened, absolutely incontrovertible. Okay, we got lots of witnesses. Um, okay, anybody else? Yeah, let me, let me say, by the way, I came at this quite neutral. I mean, I'm a lifetime supporter of the Cuban Revolution, except, you know, I learned a lot. Yeah. Okay. Oh no, uh, the, the decisions were never political. Um, I was, uh, what, I, what I wanted to do was to, okay, you can't include everything. And everybody's judgment is faulty. And I can think of, without trying real hard, a dozen poets <clears throat> that it wouldn't be, would have been nice to have in there that I didn't include. Um, what I was interested in was creating a picture of the whole. You know, something that you could say, okay, this pretty much represents the matrix. Now I've discovered this other poet who isn't in there. How does he fit in the picture, he or she? That's really what I was after. So I first had to figure, I've read a great deal of poetry. I had to figure out which poets to include, what tendencies had to be represented, um, what subject matters, where subject matter counted, had to be represented. Um, and then went, around cho went about choosing the individual poems. Now, one of the things about anthologies is they, make, they never make anybody happy. You know, I mean, the more, the more people know, the less, you know, people are very grateful for it, Cubans, but nobody's in a hundred. <laughs> one young scholar who's, now, who's a Cuban who's now at Harvard uh, and is something of a Piñera scholar, uh, I don't think he's doing his dissertation on Piñera, his reaction, I did, I did 12 pages of Piñera, I did a very healthy dose of Piñera. His reaction was, how come you left out my favorite poem? Well, among other things, I don't know what his favorite poem was. <laughs> but you get that kind of reaction. Or another one, there's an, a, a poem often anthologized of Lizama's, uh, uh, the Takonoma, uh, the, the, the Japanese recess in the wall, where a Buddhist-themed a Buddhist poem, um, usually printed, well, it's printed as the last poem in his uh, collected poems. It's not clear whether it was the last one he wrote, but it was a very late poem. The reason it's anthologized, among other things, is that it's, by Lizama's standards, extremely easy to read. I mean, Lizama is really difficult. Um, after a, 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 I was at a party, and with all Cubans, and in the, in New York, and one young woman from Cuba um, looked at the anthology and she said, "So you were out to break canons." Well, that surprised me, because I certainly wasn't out to break canons. I mean, one of the things that had to be represented was this is what everybody thinks is important. Um, I said, what do you mean? Well, you didn't include that poem. Well, you know, there's only so much space, right? And the, the, two, two, the two very long poems of Lazama's that I included, I thought were absolutely inevitable choices. They had to be there, and it didn't leave room. But that was, you know, so you always get that. You know, and I mean, you know, you, you never feel good about it. You know, you feel great about not having to do it anymore, but you never feel good about, 100% good about the product. All right, no, let me, I want to say one other thing about, about the politics. Okay. <clears throat> when you do an anthology, you get involved with politics, inevitably. Whether you mean to or not, it's going to be seen as such. And it's, I think the first lines in the, in the, in the introduction talk about whatever I do, this is really not a politically based book, whatever I do, it's going to be seen as such. Uh, it, that goes without saying, that's the way it is. I mean, Coser uh, has made a point of being 100% apolitical in his public statements. That's a political statement, and he's very aware that taking of an apolitical position in Cuban poetry is a political statement. It's about the value of poetry as a separate thing, and don't mess with it. Okay. Um, I was with a bunch of Cubans, and I didn't know what they, I mean, I knew the, the, the guy who had invited me, but I didn't know the other people. And uh, we got into a discussion, and this woman who had left Cuba when she was five and never gone back, um, 
left in the first wave of, 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 of immigrants uh, after the revolution. She was saying, she was g going through all of the undoubted accomplishments of the Cuban regime and doubting them and explaining why they weren't true. Um, and one of them that she said was, well, they, everybody talks about the low infant mortality rate. <clears throat> That's because when there's a damaged fetus, the government encourages abortions. She didn't say demands because it doesn't, but it does encourage them. And my immediate reaction was, oh, that's like Holland. It was like ships passing in the night. I missed it, and I didn't understand it until I got home, and I was thinking about it. You know, what was going on? How did we get into an argument? I mean, we're basically on the same side. How did we get in? You know, I mean, I love poetry. She loves poetry. How did we get into this argument? For me, it was purely a health policy decision to allow and promote abortions when feasible, when it made sense. She's Catholic, well, as were a lot of that first generation of, uh, of emigres. She was a devout Catholic. For her, it meant he was the Antichrist, that, Q that Castro was the Antichrist. Whereas for me, I mean, I'm, I'm a Jewish atheist. You know, it just was, okay, I can understand that as a policy. Like that, you know, it's, it's very, it's, there are no simple things you can say about Cuba. That's bottom line. There's nothing you can say that's simple about Cuba. Okay. I don't know when they kick us out, so if, if people have more questions, I'm, I mean, my voice recovered, so, okay.